Good morning, everybody. I'm Bonnie Gardner, co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Our forums are scheduled for most Sundays at noon, and they're free and open to the public, and we encourage you to attend. For more information on our forums, you can go to our church website at www.austinuu.org. And today, Dale Beulah, a very active member of our forum committee, is going to be introducing Greg Kazar, a rising star in Austin and state politics. Thank you, Bonnie. Good morning, everyone. It's not raining. Have you noticed? <laughs> That's great. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gregorio Casar, Greg Casar. He's a native Texan. He's the son of Mexican immigrants and the newly elected Austin City Council member from District 4. After graduating from the University of Virginia, he became the political director of the Workers' Defense Project, and we've had folks from that group that have uh, appeared on our forum in the past. There he spearheaded a, a campaign that won uh, major policy reforms to improve wages, education, and workplace safety across the city of Austin, and he, they also garnered some national attention. He was elected to the city council in 2014 by a landslide. Uh, the Austin American statesman called it the most carefully watched council race in our cycle. At age 25, he was the youngest council member, although unfortunately he has gained a year since then. Greg's generation is really the future of our city. We count on them to help us to move to a more sustainable place with clean air and water, affordable places to live, and leadership to promote equality and justice for all the cities of Austin. It's my pleasure to present my friend Greg Kassar. Uh, thanks so much for having me here, and thank you so much for the kind introductions. I'm going to start by telling a very short story, and I've, as I've learned in my very short stint in politics, politicians tend to be able to take up a lot of time telling stories about themselves, so I'm going to promise to keep my story very short, but I, I hope it's, uh, it illustrates a little bit about why I ran and then um, hopefully is a good springboard into the short talk that I'm going to give. So uh, I grew up in Houston. Uh, my mother and father both uh, came from Mexico, but my mother still owns the home that she grew up in with her brother and sister and mother and father back in Mexico, and so we'll regularly go back uh, to that home, and we usually have lots of family members that live there um, you know, and, and just stay in the house while, while we've been here in the States. And so I have a very clear memory of when I was uh, five years old going back to my mother's home in Cuernavaca, and it was Christmas Day, and I was out sort of on, on the back patio, and my mom was coming to look for me because breakfast was ready. And the back patio uh, has sort of very traditional Mexican tiles. And my mom said, asked me what I was doing in the backyard, and I told her uh, that the earth was flat. And I, instead, I was a pretty nerdy kid, so I'm sure she was starting to think, okay, now I'm going to talk about astronomy with my son and the spherical nature of planets. But no, I, she saw that I actually had stuck the end of a bike pump into a hole in the grout between a couple of tires, uh, between a couple of tiles, and then I was sitting there with a bike pump trying to pump the uh, the earth back up. And then I meant that it had a flat, like a like a bike tire had a flat. Um, and uh, and in, and my mother, what she did was instead of dragging me over to have breakfast with my cousins, she pulled up a chair and uh, yelled to my dad to grab a camera because she was just going to hang out there while I sat and did my work. Because she told me I had a lot of work to do. And, and I think that that it has been sort of a key value that she um, has had instilled in me and then also sort of being a Catholic social justice kid instilled in, in myself that um, if you believe in something and, that's, and, and you want to work hard at it, that that's the best thing that you can spend uh, your time doing. And so I decided to run for the, for the city council, not thinking about you know, polling and exactly what voters wanted to hear, but instead just trying to do something that folks a few skeptics may have called um, a naive thing to do, but just try to say wh what I thought was right and that believing that a lot of folks would help out and volunteer and listen and care um, if we just fight for what the things that we think are just and good, even if it's at a local level, even if it's small, even if some folks might think that you're just sort of uh, naively pumping some air into the, the ground here or there trying to, um, trying to do some work that a lot of folks hopefully would notice and that people um, that that would be refreshing, even if some folks might think that it's um, that it's silly. That for for me, it was a deeply that is deeply meaningful to try to do some work uh, that promotes um, uh, you know, justice and equality um, 
in our city. And thankfully, it seemed like it worked. As Dale said, some people might disagree whether or not I was elected or not, but I, so far it's felt like I've been elected. I've been on the city council for five months, and, and I have seen how much control and how much power, even though it is limited in many ways, we do have in our local government and how important it is, especially as our federal government has done less and less governing and our state government uh, seems to want to ungovern um, and thankfully is only here for a few months every couple of years. It leaves more and more responsibility um, on, on local government, on what it is that we can do um, as a city council and how it is that we can expand our view on what the city can and should do. That was a lot of the work that Workers' Defense Project had taught me to do, which is to expand the notion that if the federal government isn't going to improve labor standards, if the state government seems to want to help worker, help companies de-unionize rather than increase collective bargaining power of, of workers, that local government can take it up and that city council members, whether it's because of their own uh, integrity and conviction or because of public pressure that we can uh, whip up the votes to make sure that we have a, a local labor regime that's different than uh, the one that's set up at the federal or state level. And that's the same thing that the environmental movement has been able to do here um, for decades. And w sort of what I want to talk a little bit about today is how we need to be bringing those two movements more and more together, especially at a moment when we change the, have changed out our entire city council and our entire way of electing our local leaders um, on the council level. And we have 10 of 11 brand new faces. There's a lot of challenges associated with that. I think that there's a lot of risks and dangers um, there. I think there has op there's already, um, to be frank, some divide that I'm seeing between those that want to um, make sure that we hold on to the environmental protections that we have won and created at a local level over the decades and those that see um, an opportunity to drive the wedge between those that care about social and economic equity issues and those that care about uh, the environment and climate change and the work that I think that the community be beyond the council has to do to make sure that those aren't uh, pit against one another because that dichotomy of false choices, um, we've seen how that has, has played out at the federal level with the Keystone Pipeline in particular. It's been really heartbreaking to see how um, corporate interests have decided to pit uh, labor advocates against environmental advocates on the issue of the Keystone Pipeline. And we've seen how that's happened at the local level with Water Treatment Plant 4 being pitched as sort of a stimulus and jobs package um, rather than exactly what it was, which now in retrospect of 2020 eyesight seems like not such a great uh, investment for our water utility uh, compared to some of the other investments that, we've, that we could have made. And so we now have an opportunity to craft a new narrative. What um, what local governing is going to look like and what kinds of choices we're going to make. And my call to the public um, is to help create that narrative in a way that doesn't have false choices, where we're not saying, well, your choice is clean air or jobs, or your choice is water that you want to drink or affordable housing, but you can't have both. Um, we need to find ways to, uh, to craft the narrative, to push elected officials, and to create the votes where we are really you know, not having to choose uh, the environment over the well-being of families whose kids are sometimes going hungry to school or who are having to pay 50% of their income on rent um, or what have you. And so there's, there's opportunities to do that. And so I want to talk uh, briefly about some of those before we get into uh, asking and answering questions, which I think is really what I'm looking forward to the most. We just had very, very difficult decisions to make about Austin Energy's uh, corporate contracts. We, for years, have had special subsidized rates for some of Austin's largest corporations. And that was an opportunity where we actually weren't having to choose between, or being asked to choose between the environment and, and low rates versus, or the environment and low rates, right? We had a choice to ask uh, large corporate users to pay their fair share and to stop being subsidized by, uh, essentially by residential users. And I was really proud that um, a majority of the council chose to end those contracts for 10 of Austin's uh, largest corporations. We, there, there are still four companies that um, are going to be receiving a, a little bit better than w what they would, and I wish that th that number was zero, but 10 was the best that we could do. But there are those rare opportunities where we can decide, look, if we are going to, um, we have a choice between subsidizing large corporate users or having extra funds so that we can do the sorts of environmental programs that we want or do the kind of weatherization that low-income customers need or to reduce electric rates for everybody, which is uh, so important in a city where the cost of living is rapidly rising. There's 
So we, there are some places where we can be reactive and think about how to make sure that we're linking the environment and working and the needs of working people, but there's also some proactive measures that I think are critically important. Right now we're going through rewriting our entire land development code, which is basically the way that we, what, what it is that we build in Austin and how it is that we build it. All those regulations are being thought through because we haven't uh, rewritten it in 30 years. It could go the way of basically just al allowing massive profits to be reaped from the growing demand for housing and offices and retail in Austin. It could go the way of us not uh, wanting to change the, the code at all to allow different kinds of building and we just end up sprawling out and there has to be some sort of organized coalition building so that we can promote affordable housing, make sure that developers when they gain additional entitlements, that means additional areas and places and ways to build, that we uh, wind up with some affordable housing and the sort of green architecture, green landscaping and green building that's so important for us to handle things like the, flood, the floods that we just had um, last weekend ways that we actually make sure that we have the adequate park space and walkability and bikeability that makes us a more sustainable city environmentally. And once again, that we aren't forced to choosing between one or the other. Um, and I think that you can see right now in the council, because of our efforts to protect the Edwards Aquifer and Barton Springs, the desired development zone going to the east side um, has resulted in a lot of tensions on the council because we're seeing property values rapidly increase um, on the central east side and all of a sudden a lot of pushback. And, and I think um, for a good reason from some of those council members to say, well, why is it that my folks are being priced out and we aren't seeing additional construction or development um, on the west side? And that's, again, playing into those false choices where with the rewrite of a land development code, we can say we need to be able to think of ways for people to live smaller since we have su such higher property values. How are we going to make sure that people can build a garage apartment in their backyard to pay off their property taxes? How can we make sure that solar panel rebates don't just go to those people um, that already have the equity and the money to do a down payment for solar panels? We need to be thinking through those pieces because otherwise what ends up happening is there's a natural push to either build over Barton Springs or to just end up pricing out everyone uh, that was a traditional resident on the central east side. And so we have to sort of be thinking above and beyond the simple one-step solutions and thinking, thinking ahead towards, well, if we rewrite this land development code, how can we make it sustainable for the environment, for our quality of life, but then also make sure that we think of it through a social justice aspect, um, especially when the, the people that are being priced out are primarily folks of color that have been residents here for a really long time. We, in my own district, uh, we are talking also a lot about park space and park equity. Uh, my district by far has the fewest acres of parkland compared to anywhere else in the entire city. Uh, we also happen to have the highest number of children and one of the highest proportions, uh, we're kind of tied with District 2 for one of the highest proportions of people living in multifamily units, which means they don't have a, uh, their own personal big front yard or big backyard, uh, but we still have the lowest number of park acres. So the question is, well, where does that money come from? Does that money come from everybody else's parks or is, are there other mechanisms that we can use to um, drive revenue? Does that mean increasing uh, the amount of, for example, a campaign might be to increase the amount of park funding that developments provide, especially when they're constructed in areas that are already park dense. Can that money be um, distributed to areas that, that badly need it? Right now we have a formula that says everybody should be within a quarter mile of a park if you're in the urban core and a half mile of a park if you're outside of the urban core, but the urban core is uh, not defined. The north of 183 is defined as a non-urban core. Of course, if you go nowadays up North Lamar, North of 183, it's the, one of the most urban parts of town. You have people living uh, in sixplex after sixplex after sixplex after apartment complex. Um, and we have, you know, literally thousands of children that are certainly not within half a mile of a park. And supposedly, if they're in an urban area, it's supposed to be within a quarter mile of a park. So addressing those sorts of issues is, I think, critical as environmentalists to be able to say, well, we aren't just protecting the environment for ourselves, but the environment should also be enjoyable and accessible to those folks that work so hard that keep our entire society in our city running. The issues of our transportation issues also should have not only that environmental aspect, but also a job quality piece to them as well. Obviously the urban rail bonds failed, but there will be other bold projects and bold ideas put forth in the coming years. We just can't keep on going on the path which we've been going on of paying nine out of every $10 just on building roads. So there will be uh, mass transit projects that will be proposed I, don't, I think that if we don't pair those mass transit projects with affordable housing 
um, at transit stops and union level jobs up and down any rail lines that we build or subways that we dig or rapid bus uh, lines that we, uh, that we protect, then we're missing out on a huge opportunity to make sure that transit is not just about folks in central Austin being able to get to their jobs more conveniently, but also actually providing some you know, deeper level of uh, benefit to the community. And so, again, I think the, the hope is how do we get, get those conversations going between immigrants' rights groups, unions, environmentalists, so that we create the choices for council that aren't about, well, you have to choose between the environment and affordability, but instead about we need to find some way to basically get those that have enough money to, to, to pay, which oftentimes are those folks that are profiting um, off of the, the demand in Austin to, to chip in their fair share as well. There are going to be some hard choices um, that we ourselves have to make, even in the best of circumstances. If, you know, if we want to really integrate the city um, acro more across racial and economic lines, it probably does mean there will be more cars parked on the street and more people in the park. And we may have to um, be tough enough to change school boundaries if we want our schools to truly be integrated and we don't have to build new schools for every new um, development. But I think those are the sorts of hard choices that our community is, is willing to make. But I, and, and I would much rather be in a place where we have to make those sorts of hard choices um, as opposed to the, the sorts of choices where we say, well, we, um, we have to build a, a pipeline out to East Texas to, to pump water in because we're running out of water. Um, and, that, and part of that is so that we have cheap enough water for low-income residents. That's just not the kind of choice that we want to put the city council in because it will be um, a very divided fight in which we will wind up with neither side winning. Um, instead of thinking about how we make our, our uh, conservation measures truly work, um, whether, whether or not we have to start the rethinking the business model for our energy utility or water utility so that we aren't just basing uh, its success on how much water we can sell or how much energy we can sell and think about the jobs that are created from that and make sure that our, um, that our residents are getting those jobs and being treated well in those jobs otherwise. Um, I, I fear that we'll wind up going down, continue going down the path that we've gone down uh, before and in the past. But there are some, some bright spots that I see. Um, and I think a lot of those bright spots are uh, with the new organizing that is occurring across town. Hopefully, um, and I, I have full, full belief that uh, Governor Abbott and the other states' lawsuits against President Obama's executive action on immigration will fail. Um, and I think that that will be a huge moment for immigration advocates um, who, you know, in pl at least places like my district, one third of the population is non-citizen. Uh, and that's starting at 51st Street, running up to Breaker between Cameron Road and Lamar 183. I mean, that's just north of here. One third of the folks are non-citizen. Um, that, if you pair up that one third of people with everybody who's under the age of 18, it means the majority of my district is not even eligible to register to vote. So that means they couldn't even come to this church, wonderfully enough, and, and become deputy registrars or get registered by a deputy registrar. So the work that has been done um, at the federal and state level to keep people from being civically engaged and keep people from voting can only hold for so long. And my, um, my sincere hope and belief is that with the president's executive action, our state will begin to see the need for immigration reform and we can move towards a place where we're organizing, engaging um, of, of working people to, to vote and to participate. And that, that will be um, a really huge step. And that hopeful, the, my hope is that we can pair that sort of advocacy with the sort of environmental um, and social justice advocacy that folks in this community are doing so that generations of people are, are, can be a part of you know, moving the needle forward here in Austin. Also, we have a very labor-friendly council which is, is a really positive step, and my hope is to push people um, to do things that cities really haven't done before in, in Texas or in the South, which means might mean that when we get a brand new hotel coming in, that instead of asking them to, perhaps instead of asking for some of the sorts of things we've asked for from hotels in the past, which might be to host this, to, this event or to participate in this or that fund, that perhaps the best thing for us to do is to ask them not to fight, um, not to fight their workers if they choose to collectively bargain or to require decent levels of wages and, and health care. And hopefully with that sort of push, essentially we're losing so much uh, across the country, so much of the industries that have traditionally been organized into unions that we can figure out a way that the new industries that are coming in and the service sector can become, uh, and healthcare sectors can become more organized in Austin and, and rebuild the sorts of unions 
um, and workers' organizations that we need to have a robust um, social justice movement that isn't just based on uh, the goodwill of people, but that actually involves uh, the folks that are making, you know, working class wages being deeply involved in, in organizing in politics and in getting out the vote. Um, and there's also been great work being done uh, by district council members. I know that now, uh, having our own districts, we can be so much better organized at touching base with our uh, own constituents. And Brandon Latham Jones, who's here in the audience, uh, on like, who's recently joined my staff, has been a fantastic organizer. And when we heard yeah. And when we heard that um, a, a mobile home community in my district had been purchased by out-of-state investors and that those out-of-state investors had not uh, legally, what the residents reported to us, had not recognized their leases and had started increasing the rent and utilities entirely outside of those leases, which is illegal um, under state law, that those residents organized, came together, held a press conference, worked with our office to get the attention that they needed um, from the local press and uh, all of a sudden wound up in the international press. The Guardian put it on their front pa page right next to Obama's story about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is incredible. And now those uh, rent increases um, have been you know, temporarily delayed and people haven't been pushed out of their homes. And that kind of organizing resulted uh, in that mobile home community being uh, one of two neighborhood associations in the entire city of Austin that is in a mobile home uh, park. And the other one was another one that Braden uh, helped organize with some residents that were facing similar issues. And so now we have two, you know, as of three months ago, there were zero uh, mobile home communities that had their own residence or neighborhood association. And three months later, because of voters voting in a 10-1 system and because of the talent of some of the people in my office, now we went from you know, never having one to having two just in a, a matter of three months. And it's that kind of, of intentional work of wanting to bring in um, young people and folks whose parents may be immigrants or who are immigrants themselves and basically the face of, of who Austin is, is really at heart and who Austin certainly will be in the coming years. Um, really intentionally bringing them into the political sphere, I think, is what is going to take us on that path. Um, but once again, we need to figure out how to make that path be sustainable, both for the environment, which is the work that I think the Austin City Council has done a great job on, even if imperfectly sometimes, but has done a great job on in the year, over the years. But how do we make sure that that, that can continue under a new 10-1 regime that I think genuinely does want to care about um, the needs of folks that uh, live in the apartments up and down North Lamar or up and down Runberg. So um, on the, I think, a really critical piece, figuring out how we um, build this, this work and, and, and a movement of working people that care also about environmental issues is affordable housing. Um, we are seeing more and more the, the pushing out and the suburbanization of working class communities in our city, and and for me, I've I've just uh, come to understand in my last few months in office that um, no matter how much you know, I want to organize, if we don't just don't have people living in my district by the end, hopefully of my second, you know, hopefully I'll have two terms, and if I don't have very many working people in my district at the end of two terms, then what was the the work for? Um, and the good news is that uh, the city council does have so much say over land use and so much say on affordable housing, and so that really has become. Uh, sort of priority number one in my mind and in the minds of so many of the of my fellow council members. I've started making it a habit to go to as many s events in schools as I can uh, and speaking with students, in element, especially in elementary and middle school. And just last week I was at career day at T.A. Brown Elementary School and sitting down with um, a bunch of third graders and I asked them, I explained what the city council was, which took actually not that much time. I asked them if they knew who the president was, if, I, if they knew who Obama was, and we got to Congress and then they figured got to what the city council was. And I, once we got over the hump after five minutes of understanding what city council was, I told them, well, what do you care about the most? What do you think that I can help you or your family with the most? And, uh, and they said three things. It was very clear from a, a class full of third graders. One was the rent is too high and we've had to move several times or change schools because the rent keeps going up. Two was that the utility bills were too high. And three was that they were, uh, several of them said that they were scared um, about whether the police would take their families away because their uh, families are immigrant families. And those were like the very three clear mandates to me from children in third grade. And that made it so clear what it was that I should um, be spending my time working on. Um, and I think it's something that we as a community have the ability uh, to, to work on. With, with public investment, we can 
leverage federal dollars and subsidize housing and, and rebuild public housing and make sure that it's in all different parts of town so that uh, students have all different kinds of opportunity and aren't concentrated in any one part of town. Um, we can rewrite our land development code to, to create the sort of supply of rental housing that we need that we're so short on right now um, and create competition amongst landlords and also in exchange for some of that increased ability to build, ask for um, affordably priced housing. And the mayor has been talking a lot about um, starting our own sort of social impact bonding program and um, housing strike fund where we ask private investors to be a part of our affordable housing um, construction here in Austin and that they may receive some smaller return on that investment than if they were in the private market, but that um, with the, the will of this community, we could be a place uh, that, you know, even if we're doing it on a small scale, even if we're just doing it here in Austin, Texas, um, that we can, that people across the country will, will see and know that, you know, even in, you know, in a place that lots of, when I go visit other parts of town, they think is like so regressive and, and behind, that if we can really kick off a big social venture capital fund uh, for affordable housing, that that could, that could resonate lots of different places and hopefully um, stop, get us off the list of, that we were recently put on as the number one most economically segregated city in the country. Um, and, and so much of that has to do with choices that we've made here at the local level. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of work to undo it, but I think that um, you know, with, with dedicated uh, folks and the kinds of people that you know, helped me get elected because I never would have been elected if there weren't people that were that big and forward thinking, that I, that I hope and think that we can uh, we can get that done. So thanks so much for uh, listening to me yeah, for a little while, and I really look forward to your questions. Hi, John Ballantyne. Um, I have a question about the renewable energy um, from that we get from Austin Energy. Um, if you look at Europe, their renewable energy portfolio is about 40% of their electricity comes from renewables. California is in the 20-some percent. We in Texas have less than 2%, and the legislature just put forth a bill, and the governor's indicated he's going to sign it to get, a, to get rid of the renewable portfolio standard that we do have. The city council here has the ability to compel Austin Energy uh, to take the lead and then voluntarily have their own renewable portfolio standard. What is your position on taking a leadership role in getting uh, Austin Energy to increase the renewable portfolio? Thank you. So the, the great news is that um, activists and advocates across Austin have worked on a generation plan to sort of build out what Austin Energy's own portfolio should like, look like in the years to come and it has a very, very robust renewable energy portion. There's still some really hard choices that need to be made. There, is, um, there, there are still some par megawatts that have not been decided about whether they would be um, you know, coal powered, gas powered, or solar powered, and we recently put out a request for proposals to fill up that gap with um, industrial level solar energy, and we'll be taking a look at what the prices look like when they do end up coming back. What we have to work towards in as that RFP comes back about whether we are going to do this as a uh, fill that megawatt gap, those several megawatt gaps through um, through natural gas or through industrial level solar is how do we make sure that we're talking both about controlling everyday people's electricity bills, especially those who are the lowest income, and how do we stay on a pathway towards being leader, or stay continue being leaders in America um, as far as renewable energy goes. There are, we have a program called the Customer Assistance Program, which basically makes sure that anybody receiving uh, federal benefits gets a discount on their electricity bill. At the beginning of this year, there were only about 70 families on the waiting list. So uh, virtual, we have a, a digital matching system that makes sure folks are signed up. But as of this month, I just found out from Austin Energy that we now have almost 2,800 families on that waiting list. And so I think that however it is that we can pair up those conversations about well, we want to go, uh, we want to meet, continue to meet and exceed our goals on renewables, especially on solar, but at the same time, we want to make sure that those families that are struggling to pay the electric bill have the ability to keep their lights on, and sometimes that, me that means we have to make decisions in other places, um, because I, I'm sure many of you all know from reading the newspapers, the legislature is continu continually breathing down our neck about the way that we want run Austin Energy, and so there's this fear uh, sometimes on the council that if we go, go too far astray in the way that we do our, um, our finances, that we could wind up losing um, sovereignty of Austin Energy. So we have to 
sort of continually be striking that balance, and we managed to, to dodge the bullet this time. There was a bill that got very far along um, that would essentially lead to a quick $200 million hole in the side of Austin Energy and likely to, to full deregulation. But thankfully, um, because of some of the great advocacy at the legislature and um, some of our mayors, honestly, very, very hard work, we did manage to get around um, that bill passing. But at the same time, there are places where we shouldn't be making that the sort of choice about, what, well, is it about hitting a renewable goal or is it about turning the lights off uh, for low-income customers? That's not the kind of false choice that we want or need, and that's why you know we were I was advocating and twisting council members' arms so hard about actually ending some of those corporate contracts that expire tomorrow. Tomorrow they will be off, um, and that they will start paying uh, the full cost of service, and that essentially saved um, that one action in itself was it was it worth about six million dollars a year and so those are the sorts of places where we need to find out how to bring in revenue for the utility so we can take care of both the environment and take care of the people that are paying the bills we have a question from Richard Halpin thank you uh, council member for the good work you're doing for our city and, and particularly for calling out the false dichotomy between the economic issues and the and the social justice issues in that vein um, I know San Antonio uh, Council um, a year or so ago initiated a um, commitment to um, solar energy and they supported building state-of-the-art solar panel factories and their own solar farms to implement those solar panels. Is an idea like that viable for Austin to put our people to work, particularly in your district with some of the empty manufacturing sites we have to produce uh, new uh, technologies for um, cleaner, safer Austin and more people going, getting living wage jobs? Absolutely. I think that there's, um, there's been a lot of conversation about how we can finance more local solar in particular. Um, I know that in other cities, well, in our city, if you take a look at the map, and I haven't looked at it too deeply yet, you can see that a lot of our solar rebates are going to very large um, commercial users and oftentimes to those homes where folks have enough means to make the, the initial down payment on solar. But in other cities, um, multifamily complexes have, uh, and places where more working people live have gotten solar panels which help pay for um, utilities because they have some method of financing. And so something that I'm exploring with Austin Energy is having each um, unit, uh, individual unit and multifamily complexes finance either weatherization or solar energy for, the, for those complexes because oftentimes landlords um, that may be out of state have very little incentive to weatherize older fourplexes or sixplexes or apartment complexes because people are looking for the cheap rent. You show up and find out that the rent is cheap and you sign the lease and you don't ask like, well, how much is the energy bill here? I mean, that's just where you find out what the rent is and then you move in. And so um, if we can start tying to a unit, say, you know, unit B uh, pays $5 a month for the financing of the weatherization and other green improvements on this complex and whether or not somebody moves in or out, that $5 charge is assessed. But if that unit is receiving 10 or 15 or $20 worth of lower utility bills because of those green improvements, then ult ultimately it's not only a wash, it's actually an improvement for the tenant. And so it's those sorts of creative financing tools that we've started to think about and look at that could both provide the jobs and then also provide some of the energy bill relief um, while at the same time investing in the sort of green infrastructure that we're behind on. We have a question from Ryan Nill. Hello. Um, so first off, I want to congratulate you and Braden and the rest of your staff for the organizing you do with the mobile home homes. I've been really impressed by that. Um, and uh, I just want to, I, I want to reiterate that I think that there's definitely a great opportunity from the environmental like energy and water crisis for getting wealth to people who need it. Um, I'm the treasurer at La Reunion Cooperative Apartments and one of the strategies I use to try to cut costs is to find these kind of like environmental policies that will lower our costs. We recently switched from manual recycling to um, you know, outsourced service recycling and we're trying to get solar on the roof and I think the big problem with solar is not that it's a conflict between affordability and, and you know, the environment. It's that it's the cost of entry. And for us, the biggest unknown on the affordability has to do with what we're seeing in the news related to the homestead tax exemption. 
and the appraisal, um, the low appraisals for commercial properties were commercial properties. So for us, the big unknown is how that's going to affect us in implementing these new kind of environmental cost savings. Could you answer your question, please? My, my question is, how do you think this will play out, the, the tax issues, how, how it will play out and how we can respond to that? Sure. So Ryan asked question, uh, a question sort of about two different proposals that are um, before the council. One was voted on last week, but was voted on sort of with full knowledge that it would continue to evolve and there would continue to be more votes. And the other one is on the agenda for this coming Thursday. So the first one is about challenging uh, the value of commercial properties. Texas law says that your, all properties should be valued basically as close to 100% of market value as possible. Um, however, there have been, mo I think, I, I forget how many states, but it's definitely over 40 states, uh, require sales price disclosure on properties so that you can find out more or less with a willing buyer and a willing seller how much a property is worth so that you can tax um, on the property tax fairly close to what it's worth. And we are not a sales uh, price disclosure state, um, and there are other state regulations that ultimately make it difficult for local governments and local appraisal districts to truly determine the price of property, especially commercial property. Residential property is much more uniform um, and is traditionally easier to, um, to value, but commercial property oftentimes is, is very d different and, and can be difficult. And so um, the city council last year commissioned a study from uh, a team of very highly qualified, in my view, experts that did determine that commercial property was um, especially devalued, was definitely undervalued rel relative to residential property. So even if residential property is, could possibly be valued a little bit less at what uh, the market is, that the commercial property in, um, relative to that is still highly undervalued. The difference was between, and the was study was between residential property and commercial property. So that residential property included multifamily units, such as um, the cooperative housing that Ryan is the treasurer for. And so what we chose to do was file, send in a challenge petition and usually when people protest their property taxes as an individual, it's because you want your, uh, your property to be revalued re re at a lower price. What the city council basically sends a petition in um, to the appraisal review board about was that we think that commercial non-residential property across the city of Austin is priced too low and should be valued higher. So the result of such a challenge, if it's successful, would be the revaluation of commercial properties in certain categories within Austin. And at the same, we would probably want to generate the same budget. So essentially what would happen would be that uh, residential properties taxes uh, relative to commercial properties taxes would go down. So the tax burden on apartment complexes uh, and single family uh, homes and duplexes would go downward, whereas commercial properties overall tax burden would, would go up. Um, so that, it, that's a, it's a complex legal issue. Uh, it involved going to the appraisal review board and possibly even to district court. Um, and if we are successful in what it is that we do, then I think residential property, regardless of whether it's rental or, um, or owner occupied, would see a reduction in their tax burden. The, um, and if we're unsuccessful, well then, you know, we tried. <laughs> um, but it is a complex legal issue and there's, and if you read the news, there's all sorts of different legal opinions about whether or not we'll be able to craft our budget if certain portions of the tax roll are still under protest and all sorts of complicated, um, basically logistical and legal issues involved therein. So when we passed the challenge last Thursday, we said this is not the last time that you're gonna see us voting on this because there's going to be um, probably dis future decisions that have to be made um, as, we, as we proceed. Nobody, um, as far as we know, has ever challenged this large of a portion of the tax rolls before. And so there's not very much case law as to exactly how this is gonna work and how it's gonna happen, so, uh, so keep watch. Um, the second question was around the homestead exemption. And um, as many of y'all may know, there are uh, percentage homestead exemptions for many of the local government units. The city of Austin has a very low homestead exemption of $5,000 of your property's value is, is off the tax roll if you own and occupy your home. Um, there is a proposal on next Thursday's agenda to increase that homestead exemption to 6%. Um, and it seems that there's a very clear direction from the majority of the council to not fund that by, um, by cutting services, but rather by increasing the tax rate a very small amount. Um, I'm, 
I am still sort of wrestling with the proposal. It's much smaller than the 20%, um, which was initially proposed by the mayor. Um, and, but ultimately, in my district, it results in less than a dollar worth of uh, tax savings for the median resident every single month. And so it's really a very small uh, change in their bills. Um, ultimately, it would likely result in a, in a small increment upward in the tax bills for uh, non-residential or non-owner occupied residential property so it would impact you know a duplex that's being rented out or a single family home that's being rented out but that impact would also be spread across retail and across offices and hotels and vacation homes um, so ultimately it, it seems to me that the fi that the six percent or seven percent or five percent homestead exemption is is to some extent symbolic um, and my hope is that we can talk, have a broader conversation about what affordability really is. It, a homestead exemption, especially at that small level, is one tool, um, and I do believe that it would, since we have such a, a difference in the burden between commercial properties and residential properties, that it could. I do see some folks' argument that it could make it more fair, but the impact on my district is probably a very, very slight, if no, increase in rents because of some slight pushing of the tax burden to the, some of those. Um, rental properties and then almost no very very little tax relief to homeowners and so my hope is that through things like code next creating uh, more supply on the rental side creating more options for people to live in smaller condos or in garage apartments uh, and missing middle types of housing that that's the way that we can really start uh, uh, take, taking sort of the axe to the real affordability issue because the homestead exemption seems like such a small tool um, I'm also going to be pushing in um, for us to have more tenant-based rental assistance programs, which um, es essentially would be programs where uh, tenants, when their apartment complexes flip or where uh, management decides to increase the rents quite a bit to sort of attract a, a new different kind of tenant, that uh, the city have some ability to intervene for families um, and, make, and make up some of that extra, um, some of the difference between what the old rent was and the present rent so that families can sort through where they're going to move to or if they're going to have to bring another family member to live there. But so often we've seen, like in the case of, of these mobile home communities, that such a jarring change of hundreds of dollars uh, in just one month just makes causes issues of displacement a lot of problems. And so um, I think that there's lots of other ways we can address affordability and that, that are going to hopefully have a much larger impact than sure the, the 66 cents a month or whatever that my median homeowner would see in my district. We have a question from Catherine Ellerton. Hi, first, thanks so much for keeping the earth inflated. My question has to do with um, uh, water conservation, which I think everyone agrees is the cheapest, easiest, least controversial solution to the water problems. What, in your opinion, do you think it would be beneficial for the city council simply to pass a very simple resolution that when Austin was under drought conditions, that announcement be made publicly to every public gathering. I'm especially thinking of the tens of thousands of people who come into Austin for South by Southwest, and I think we miss a great opportunity to inform them and encourage them to use water responsibly, as well as simply educating our school kids. You know, hey, we're under drought two conditions. Yeah, you can do more or less with that as a teacher. But I mean, do, am I being unrealistic or just idealistic? Do you think that would help raise our awareness and change our behavior in terms of conserving water and using water more responsibly? I think that the education effort can always be better and bigger, um, and and the city council uh, has worked really hard to sort of to force folks to use less water. Honestly, I mean, with with drought restrictions, and we can continue to to use those. Our actual water usage per capita has been dropping rapidly, and I think part of the issue that folks are seeing is now that we're conserving more and more water, the, w the water utilities business model is is built on selling folks water. And so how do we, so there's this, this, this conflict within the city of well, we want to conserve water, as you've said, because it, we can deal with the drought, but then there are folks that work at the very same city that say we need to sell water, otherwise how are we going to pay our employees or how are we going to keep rates at what their current ra rates are. And so figuring out how we ch change that business model in a time where conservation is clearly the long-term cheaper model is really what I think the city council has to work on for us to be able to genuinely want to educate people and genuinely want people to use less water because we kind of are in a schizophrenic situation right now where we have to sell more water or we also have to sell as little water as possible. Um, and so, and, 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 and that's very difficult because right now 
both on the water utility end and the Austin Energy end, the dividend, um, and it's a different size dividend on percentage points, but some of the profits from that water and from that energy then pour into the general fund, which we use to pay for parks, library, and especially public safety. And so, um, you know, if we were, if we had to flip the script, it would essentially result in us sending money back to uh, the water utility or to the energy utility, which right now the, the choice that's before us then is well, which services then are cut from the general fund. So it, it involves some real some real choices, but I think choices that we have to make because otherwise, um, if we if we um, if our population growth continues on the track that it's on right now, it may seem cheaper um, for us to keep subsidizing the water utility uh, or to to keep on having sort of this split personality, but long term the cap structure projects that we'd have to, to bond for would be very expensive. And so it's right now we're sort of living in a world of, of willful medium sidedness, maybe short sidedness and pushing ourselves to go to that, uh, that longer sided way of saying we need to just change the way that this works if we think these drought conditions are going to persist is what we have to do. How will City Council make Capital Metro increase the frequency of Route 1 which runs through your district? Its own internal report said that the Metro Rapid was running 1,000 people below intended frequencies. This impacts both environment and population, access to jobs and um, food, um, housing, and of course, um, you're aware of this. No. So the city council uh, needs to address this because the Capital Metro Board is not, and staff are not working on this issue. Uh, the, Met, the Route 1 bus is constantly overcrowded wall to wall. Thank you. So the, the Cap Capital Metro, just to give some background, received um, a grant from the federal government to start doing sort of rapid bus service, which resulted, unfortunately, in my view, in a reduction uh, an overall sort of reduction of, of ridership on Lamar. That ridership supposedly has started to re-increase a little bit, but I have to take a look at the numbers because I know that at the time during the campaign it was still below what it was. So we essentially invested money to turn our bus a little bit more into a commuter system uh, for, to get people from longer distances up north, down south, uh, but the unintended, un unintended consequences is less folks got on the bus. And so um, I've started having conversations with Cap Metro. We now have our new two city council members on the Cap Metro board, that's Delia Garza and Ann Kitchen. So we do have two votes um, on that board. And in my first conversations with Capital Metro, um, I did bring that up with them and they'll be bringing back data because their hope was that once people got used to the new 801 to give, to give it a chance. And I thought it made sense to give it the shot and see if the ridership eventually gets to the place that it's supposed to be. But if not, then I think it's really important we have a great opportunity as a new council to say, well, we messed something up. Because in the, in the past, it's harder to say you made a mistake because you yourself made the mistake. The, the good news is right now, since it's 10 out of 11 people are brand new, it's a little bit easier to say there was a mistake in the past because it wasn't us. Um, <laughs> now we'll see how we fare with that when it's four years from now. And so I, that is one thing that I've asked for Capital Metro to bring back to me is what the numbers are looking like for ridership on Lamar. One thing that is being kicked off in two weeks, though, is a doubling of the frequency of the bus on Runberg, um, which is very, very exciting. So they've announced that mid, in mid-June, the Runberg bus is going to stop running every 30 minutes and run every 15. And it's a, it's a, con a constant challenge that, uh, that public transportation and buses faces. Uh, if you don't have that many people riding the bus, so you don't really want to increase the frequency, less people want to get on the bus because they have to wait 30 minutes for the bus to come. So sometimes you have to take the, the jump and increase the frequency so that people get on it and subsidize it for a while until you see people riding the bus. And my, my hope is that we can do the same thing on Lamar. We have about eight minutes left. Uh, we have a question from Pat Bula. I have a question about gas versus sol gas plant versus solar. Um, everybody seems to talk a lot like, well, the gas plant will be cheaper. And I'm not convinced it will be. I understand that there's a lot of uh, possibilities of West Texas uh, wind and solar coming in at a really reduced rate, and that might be better for us than uh, a new gas plant. Can you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So um, we, didn't, we don't know which one would be cheaper until we ask and we put bids out. 
And so the city council recently passed a resolution issuing uh, a request for proposals to find out what price we can get um, solar energy at. The way that Austin Energy has had to have sort of a shift in mentality, and all of us have to have a shift in mentality now that we're selling electricity back to the grid through the ERCOT system. And so what our hope is that, is that we can keep our energy as clean and renewable as possible and sell that cheaper renewable energy back into the grid to, to basically make money for the utility. The utility basically sells the, the energy that we generate to the rest of the state. And so we'll be getting those numbers back very soon. Um, and that's when the decisions will really be made based on data uh, rather than people just assuming, well, gas is dirty, so it must be cheaper, and solar is clean, so it must be expensive. That, uh, you know, so, we will, so we're actually getting those numbers so that we can make um, an actually informed decision and then make a value judgment for ourselves um, on, on which one is better and why. Uh, on this Thursday's agenda, we also have a resolution to, um, to, for our, on our climate protection plan, which is really exciting about working together with uh, folks all across the country um, on, on climate change issues and how, to, and, and how we coordinate on those. So that's, that's an exciting resolution that uh, has been co-sponsored between East Side and West Side Council members. So that's um, an exciting uh, issue coming up this Thursday. Regarding price disclosure, that would be a very simple two-liner that at the time of sale, price, the price of the property needs to be disclosed to the appraisal district. So um, I'm wondering why that is so hard. That's been an issue for 15 years. Why is it so hard? Maybe if you go up to the legislature, you're a very good speaker, could you can go up there and convince them? Um, there are organized associations of realtors and commercial property owners that I think are less eloquent than me, but for some reason have more say at the legislature than I do. Um, and... Um, and so the, that's, the, that's the issue that we face is, honestly, um, the, we'll just frankly call it what it is, the corporate power at the state legislature is great. Um, and, and we have it at the top of our legislative agenda along with many other cities every single legislative session, and it goes nowhere every single legislative session. And so that is why we have to try to be you know, smart and slick and try different things uh, like the commercial, uh, like the commercial challenge, who we end up having to pay a few hundred thousand dollars to an expert, so that we can use the legal system and use whatever tools we have at our disposal to show that essentially the Texas Constitution about market value, we we believe that that, that is actually happening here in Austin. Um, so I wish that it was easier. I mean, I wish I could. I, I I think that it's right to to keep saying it though. I think that even if you don't think a bill is going to pass, it's the right thing to go to the legislature and say we want to be able to raise the minimum wage. We want to be able to have sales price disclosure. We want um, all these things that you've tried to take away from us. Um, we want inclusionary zoning for owner-occupied units. Those are sorts of things that have been outlawed um, at the legislature and continue to be outlawed, like the dent, like the dents and fracking ban. Um, but m what I'm starting to think about and learn is let's do as much as we can here at the local level. Even if people say the legislature is going to come back and take it away, then if we pass 20 progressive things and they take 17 away, then at least we wound up with three instead of none. Um, and we just have to keep calling them, calling it out for what it is. But unfortunately, um, it's just the raw power of that lobby at the legislature. Um, I'm a member of this church, and I wanted to, I've never been to a city council meeting, so I need to know uh, how how do I? I mean, when are the public, you know, when are the public meetings to where people could just listen to what happens, and also when people are allowed to speak up. Um, where do I find that information and also the parking? You know, how do we get that information so that way we can go down there and speak if we need to or just listen to what's happening? Great, thank you for asking. So um, city council meetings are almost every single Thursday except in July. Um, and that's when the city council makes our, most of our decisions is on Thursdays at noon sharp every single almost every single week there's 10 slots for citizen communication where you can speak for three minutes yes and absolutely so if you go to the um, to the city website you can sign up for that citizen communication um, and speak for three um, for three minutes at noon almost any given Thursday we have uh, a parking garage underground under City Hall yes and um, and the 
uh, parking is redeemable, and then there's also several bus lines uh, that run by um, that run by City Hall. Uh, you know, the the 801 and several others go right by right right by there on Guadalupe. Most Thursdays, we also have committee hearings on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays where we speak about very specific and particular issues. And those, austintexas.gov, if you go to the government and city council tab on the website, will tell you, has, has a full calendar for you. And there, the agendas on what we're going to talk about are always, by law, have to be posted 72 hours in advance. So 72 hours before, you have to know exactly what it is we're talking about. And you can sign up um, to speak on, for three minutes on basically anything that we're voting on. Um, and then also at noon on those Thursdays, you can talk about whatever it is you want. And if you're coming in to speak about something productive, it's, uh, you're, you're, we, sometimes we have you know, people that just come and read us a poem, which is nice, but you can honestly talk about whatever you want, a, a, a poem to a, all the way to a serious discussion on public policy issues are all allowed there. So. And do you want to take just one minute to wrap up? Well, I, I really, you know, appreciate the time to come here and speak with y'all. Um, the times that I've been in the church recently were getting a bunch of my volunteers deputized to register voters, and then prior to that, uh, coming with some of the worker members of Workers' Defense Project um, one Labor Day, I think, a few years ago. And it's odd to be here now in this capacity because I still feel like I'm sort of here in the, in the other capacity to, to some extent. And that's what I'm asking for folks to do is to is to continue participating and for me to continue organizing folks to pay attention to what's happening on the local level. So as soon as we're done here today, if, if there's a particular issue that's of interest to you that you want to stay plugged in it on, please come and take um, a business card, a, uh, get, call us on the phone, get us an email. We have working groups that we're um, working on both transportation and shared economic prosperity and parks, um, sort of getting minds together to think about how we tackle those issues and if you want to participate in that or any other ways we really want people to be as plugged in um, with what it is we're doing on the council whether you're in my district or not um, because it's for me the, the whole city is so tied up together that you know the, the, the future of my district I think is in many ways the future of the city and I and I would really appreciate your support on any of those things so thanks again for having me and thank you for your thank you. Thank you for your commitment to change, your involvement, and your leadership, and I think we're going to be following uh, your work very closely, and uh, we appreciate your coming today, Greg. Thank you. Thanks again.